Good morning and welcome to my father's place. The word for today is breakers, billows, flames, and floods. Wow. <laughs> or floods and flames. <laughs> anyway, bad stuff. It seems like it's bad when it's happening. But we're going to talk about God's purpose in it all. Because he always has a purpose for everything he does. And he is always good. Let me pray, and then we'll begin. Father, I give honor and glory to you, to your Son, Jesus Christ, and to your precious Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, let this word go forth to your church in the power of you and in the wisdom of you and in the might of you, that just as you transformed me with it, you would also transform others by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Something I learned just recently that I knew, but you know, I had never really heard it spoken just this way, is that this word is not just something I look at for information or facts or even truths, but it's, I look at this word so it changes me continually from image to image and glory to glory. So I pray that today you are transformed. That's what I just prayed. We are looking at the things that happen to us, and we say, why? And I'm going to begin with my mother again, because the Lord gave me this word to give her. And it is from Psalm 42, verse 7. And it says, Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. And also, this was not a word from her, but I have added this because it's the same idea. From Isaiah 43. But now, says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. He doesn't promise that those things won't come, but he promises that you are his and that these things won't harm you. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's worth a hallelujah. So my mother had all these things, breakers and billows and floods and, and waves. Oh, my flames. Oh my, she had everything. She had four years ago fallen down a hill, was hung upside down, stuck in a bush for 12 hours before she was discovered. And then I've already told you in past messages about her most recent things where she fell on the floor, couldn't get up. She was there on her stomach for 18 hours, almost dead when my brother found her. Those are breakers and billows and floods and flames. Then on top of that, she had a double stroke, a stroke and then another within minutes. So she was overwhelmed by this. And I was up in Maine, and I was just waiting to hear from the Lord on what to say. And the first thing that he gave me, of course, as I shared recently, was that I am her fish. A fish caught in the net for the Lord. And so that was lovely. And she laughed in the spirit, and I laughed in the spirit, and it was wonderful, and walls came down, and all kinds of good stuff happened because I had been judging her faith. So it was the third full day of me going to be with her for most of the day. And I was in devotions in the morning, and I was just talking to the Lord, and I was saying, what do you want me to tell Mom? And he said, tell Jane, they're my breakers and billows. They're mine. Because it says very clearly, in verse 7 of Psalm 43, all your breakers 
and your waves have rolled over me. You might be knocked down by them, but they're his. So do you think he's going to make it so you can get up again? Amen, he will. So she was, when I told her this, she rejoiced and I rejoiced because she knew, I said, the Lord has you and he will bring you out. And surely he has, just as he said. And so that was an encouragement to her. It was a reminder to me that when things happen, God knows and he will deliver. So she had all of those things happen to her. And yet they were God's. He allowed them. Just as Jonah said in Jonah 2.3, he said, all your billows and waves have washed over me. And you know the story of Jonah that he had refused to speak at Nineveh to the people there because he hated them and they were enemies of Israel, but he was to go there and tell them to repent. And he didn't, and he got on a boat with a bunch of other guys, went out in the ocean, and there was a terrible storm. He knew he was the cause of it, and he said, throw me overboard so you guys can be saved. And so they did, and the Lord, the Lord, the Lord appointed a fish, appointed a fish to a large fish to swallow him. And he was in the belly of the fish for three days. Whatever was that for? He had already repented. He had confessed to these guys that he indeed was the cause of the storm. And it was because he had not obeyed God. So he had already confessed that he was in the wrong. And he had said, let me go so your lives are spared. Yet the Lord appointed a fish. Why did he do that? Well, Jonah, originally the storm came about because of his disobedience. That caused him to repent. But why the fish? And why three days and three nights? He surrendered himself for the lives of those who were on the ship. Long after, Jesus came. And he told the rulers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that like Jonah, he would be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights so that we could all, everyone who believes on his name, could be saved and delivered. Do you see that there's a purpose in everything that God does? For mom, it was a glorification of God that she survived twice things that should have killed her. And it was because of the Lord's hand that she survived. Do you see that Jonah, when he repented and was still thrown in the sea, why? Why couldn't God deliver him sooner while he was swimming around? Why did he wait until he sank? Why did he put that fish in his path so that he would be eaten? So that. It would be a type for Christ so that Christ, when he came, would say, just like Jonah, it was a sign. It was a prophetic act accomplished by God through his prophet, Jonah. That is why that happened in that way. And certainly after the three days, the fish vomited up Jonah onto dry land After three days, Jesus rose. Hallelujah. So, do you think there's a significance 
to what you're going through? Is it something, is it a matter of disobedience with mom? I know the Lord showed me she is a well-saved, soundly saved woman. I have no idea except that I know that he delivers. I know when she was on that floor for 18 hours, she was crying out to him. Help me, Lord. And so there's a purpose in it. Now, when Jeff had his heart attack in 2011, here he is, saved, born from above, filled with the Holy Spirit, doing the Lord's work, filled with God's love, following in all his ways, and yet a heart attack strikes him, tries to kill him, tries to kill him. Why? I could have said that. Why are you doing this, Lord? But it never occurred to me to ask the Lord or to, by asking that particular thing, point the finger at him to say, why did you let this happen? It never occurred to me because I know God is good and he is always good and everything he does is good and there's always a purpose. And so, all of the time that he was in the ICU, he was a shining witness, as terribly hurt and damaged as his heart was, as much as his body was totally flooded by cardiac enzymes, which happen when the muscle of the heart dies. He was flooded. They, the numbers were right through the roof. And yet he's there telling people about Jesus and reaching out to the ICU nurse that was taking care of him. And on that third day when I brought my guitar in and we worshiped together, God was glorified out of it because he healed Jeff. His heart is fine now. His efficiency of his heartbeat is right in the middle of the normal range. And before, it was in a place where he could have suddenly died any minute. And that was right up until Jesus came into that hospital room. Do you think God received glory out of it? Now, God didn't appoint a heart attack for him. But in the midst of it, I, I saw and I trusted that he was going to be glorified. Those were billows and waves and floods and flames. And when he came home, the Lord gave me the word from Isaiah 43 that he would go through the waters and they would not overwhelm him and he would walk through the flames and he would not be burned. And sure enough, there was no residual damage. That's what the Lord was telling me in that. And so even though it looked like a terrible situation and you might say, why? Remember, God is faithful. He does these things. He, he allows these things because he wants to be glorified out of it. Jonah surely gave God glory. And he went forth and did what he should have done in the first place, warned Nineveh, and indeed they repented. So, there's a purpose there's a purpose. And let me see. What else do I want to say about this? The sons of Korah, when they wrote Psalm 42, here was their situation. They had been exiled to Babylon. The whole of Judah had been exiled to Babylon because they had disobeyed God even to the point of sacrificing their children to false gods. And the time of their exile was 70 years, just like Jeremiah had prophesied. 
God was going to bring them back. But there was going to be this time where they were exiled, where they were separated from God's presence and protection until a whole new generation was born in captivity. And then 70 years had passed and they were brought back into the land and Jerusalem and all of that portion of Israel were restored. Why did he send them into exile? Because they had disobeyed God. They were rebelling against him. He, he does these things to show you that there's a consequence for disobedience, for rebellion against him. But he also rescues and delivers so that you may know that he is faithful to restore you when you repent. When you repent. And so when you are experiencing all the things that we all have to go through, no matter how much God has said we're righteous, just as with Job, he said, Job is righteous. Go ahead and test him, Satan. And yet, at the end, when uh, Job repented for trusting in his own righteousness, God restored him twofold. So you see, throughout these things, he is revealing to you that there is a cost for disobedience, but there is also deliverance from him. Continually, he's doing these things that you may know his faithfulness, not only to accomplish his word against those who rebel, but also to reestablish he shows his goodness in all of these things. He does not leave you in your sin, and he delivers you out of it. And since Christ, there is a deliverance out of your sin that is far greater than what happened with Old Testament saints. And that is deliverance from slavery to it. And that is the greatest deliverance of all. It is one that he promised in Ezekiel and also in Jeremiah, but it is one that he brought to pass at Pentecost in Acts 2 and still brings to pass even now. So if you are being buffeted, if you are being overwhelmed, you feel overwhelmed, what should you do? Don't assume all these strange things are happening you, to you for a bad reason. Don't question God, but run to him. Say, Lord, examine my heart. If there is any wicked way in me, show it to me. And he will. And when he does... You will repent. And when you repent, he will bring you out. As he did with Judah from exile. And with mom and with Jeff and with all of the other circumstances that we have had that truly are these things, they were and could have overwhelmed us. But we sought God and the Lord gave us promises and words of restoration and we believed him now if you're in a medical situation certainly you're going to hear a lot of bad news just like Jeff did from the doctors about the condition of his heart but those things though they tried to sway me when he gave that word to get my guitar and go and worship with Jeff on that third day. I did it. That was nothing of me. It was all of him. But I did obey when he prompted me. And Jeff was totally restored. 
it's very hard. I know from when I had MS, it's very hard to look beyond your circumstances, things you never get any good news about the state of your disease. It's always getting worse. There's really nothing they can do to stop it. It's incurable. And that's all you hear. And if you are one who's listening who has MS or some dread disease like it, you're going to hear you're going to hear from the medical establishment. And it's not going to be good news. But look to the one who has the good news. Look to the one who brings you out. Look to the one who delivers you. Look to the one who saves you. Look to him. And don't allow the natural facts of the matter to get in the way of seeking him. Now, I certainly don't believe in saying you're healed when you're not. But you will know very well when the Lord has healed your body. You will know very well. And then's the time to proclaim and glorify him. Until then, offer him offerings of thanksgiving. Because he will do it. He is faithful to his word. He holds it above all things. And in Jeremiah 1, it says he is faithful to accomplish it. And he will do it. I myself have been recently the subject of these things. Breakers and billows and floods and flames. I, had, I have a disease, had a disease, called diverticulitis in my colon. And it was exceedingly painful. And Jeff and I cried out. Jeff cried sometimes, help, Lord, because I would be doubled right over with pain. So last Thursday... It occurred to me, and I said to the Lord, Lord, it was so much more difficult from my perspective for you to heal me of MS because you had to fix everything that had been damaged in my brain. You had to restore nerves and everything else and in my spinal cord and in my eyes. You had to do all of that, and you even had to reset my immune system so it didn't attack my brain anymore, and you did that. That's much more complicated, much more complex than this. So Lord, heal this simple thing. That Thursday, before I prayed that, I could barely walk because any jostling at all would just send pain right through my whole abdomen. I got up the next morning after asking the Lord to heal that simple thing and there was no pain, and I could walk around without pain. And there were a few little twinges, but I was free. I knew I was free, and I knew that the twinges were simply from tenderness from what had been there. It's kind of like when you get a cut, and it's, it's healed over, but it's tender around it for a little while. So I knew it was done. And I said in that prayer, after I said, Lord, MS was much harder. There's one thing I left out of what I said to him. MS was much harder. Forgive my unbelief and heal this simple thing. You see, even though I was healed of MS and he has delivered me through many waves and billows and floods and flames and every other kind of thing, I still didn't believe him when I was praying. I was mouthing the words. I know him to be a healer, but I wasn't believing him for healing for this. So I said, forgive my unbelief. That was the key. 
That was the key. And so, even with Jesus and the disciples, they were in the boat with him. He was sleeping. The storm came. They said, Lord, don't you care that we're about to perish? He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves. The sea went calm. He said, be still, peace be still. Everything went calm. And then he rebuked his disciples, oh, you of little faith. Help my unbelief, Lord, and heal this simple thing. And again, when he was walking on the water and they didn't have him in the boat this time because he was growing their faith, they cried out. They thought he was a ghost or something walking on the water. Nobody can walk on the water but Jesus because he's above all things and over all things. And he's the one that holds the whole earth together. So, and the universe as well. So, Peter goes out, tries walking on the water, begins to sink in a sea of doubt, just like I did when that night when the Lord healed me, when I reached up to him and said, Jesus, help me. And he gets in the boat with Peter, and the sea is calm. And he says, oh, you have little faith. Why didn't you believe? Now, that didn't mean that he exiled them or sent them away, but he was teaching them that he's faithful and that he's over every other thing. Every other thing in this whole universe, there is nothing greater than him and there is nothing that he does not have dominion over. Glory to God. Not a thing. Hallelujah. And so he doesn't have dominion over diverticulitis and he doesn't have dominion over MS and he doesn't have dominion over a heart that has the whole front dead. And he, he has dominion over all of these things. He has dominion over all of these things. He has dominion over a woman who's had a double stroke and he restores her to the point where she can go back to assisted living. Praise be to God. The Lord wants to make you a witness of his faithfulness through what you are going through right now. Look to him. He is above all things. He has dominion over your entire circumstance. And he knows exactly what's going on. Run to him. If he shows you sin, repent. If there's no sin, cry out as I did. Forgive my unbelief in your faithfulness, Lord. And release me from this. Or heal me from this. Right now I'm going to pray that the Lord would do that even through the faith that I have. Because James 5 says, the prayer of faith, not necessarily you having it, but me having it, will heal. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. You deliver and you deliver and you deliver. Jesus, you heal and you heal and you heal. There is nothing above you. There is nothing that you don't govern and have dominion over. No sickness, no such thing of any kind. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, in your name, Lord, I pray for the healing of everyone who is listening. I pray for deliverance. I pray for eyes to be opened. I pray for repentance to happen. I pray for the words to come forth that would make that so. Lord, let this be a day of great release because you are faithful in the storm and you are faithful to get us out. Hallelujah. Let it be so. Amen.